good morning everybody and uh, i uh, welcome you all to uh, let's talk astronomy on behalf of the let's talk astronomy team uh we are in this covid-19 uh, pandemic situation where we'll have to stay at home and uh, follow social distancing and uh, this should not prevent us from being inquisitive and asking questions on astronomy and uh, science in general and stuff like that so a few of the postdocs and phd students from uh, india who are working across the world we got together and uh, we decided that uh, we should conduct these uh, let's talk astronomy sessions so that uh, we will be able to interact with you and we will be able to take questions from you and uh, answer them and we'll be able to give some brief overview of uh, what's happening in astronomy and uh, watch the latest research that's going on and things like that so here you can see the team members uh, all are indian citizens and uh, they are doing their postdoc or they are doing the phd uh, in the universities around the world and uh, they all have come together to uh, make this sessions happen okay so when we uh, think about uh, different fields of science what usually happens is like we have a problem we propose a problem and we develop a theory for that problem and then we conduct experiments to uh, experiments in the laboratory and uh, get some results out of it and verify the theory so what we can do is we can tune the parameters in the lab we can change the temperature we can change the magnetic field and things like that and uh, we can see how the results are varying to match our theory but uh, science for astronomy is not that simple so astronomers have to be a bit like uh, detectives and uh, they don't have a lab here on earth the whole sky is their laboratory so nature is uh, conducting experiments for us and we'll have to just take the uh, results that nature is giving us we don't have the uh, freedom to go and tune the uh, parameters there in space so astronomers basically do things like this they have a theory that they propose and they make computer simulations uh, by which they get some results then they conduct observations and uh, they match these observations with the simulations that they got and if these two are matching then the theory that they proposed is right if it's not then they'll have to tune the theory or they have to come up with a new one so this is how astronomers usually work on and this is what we will be showing in our slides as well today and we wanted to uh, talk to you about uh, everything starting from the center of our solar system all the way to the outer edge of the universe and uh, what is the center of our solar system the sun so we will be uh, starting our session with uh, the sun and um, then we will have a question and answer session uh, where we'll be taking questions uh, related to the sun and daytime astronomy then we'll move on to the nighttime astronomy which uh, will deal with the stars the exoplanets galaxies uh, cosmology and uh, instrumentation and observation which we are mostly familiar with when we talk about astronomy this is what we usually think of so there's also the daytime part to it which we will Uh, which is what we are trying to show over here so after the nighttime astronomy we will have another question and answer session and uh, followed by this we'll have um, a session on career so if you are really interested in astronomy and if you want to make astronomy your career how do you pursue it and what are the paths that are available for you guys to pursue a career in astronomy and then it is followed by a general question and answer session so this is a bigger um, question and answer session where we'll be answering uh, uh, career related doubts and uh, the unanswered questions from the daytime and the nighttime astronomy and the questions that you guys are giving to us and if we are not able to answer all your questions don't worry we will get back to you by sending mails to you okay so how do you ask your questions uh, if you see your youtube video uh, if you click on uh, show more then uh, the descriptions there is a link given there if you just click on that you will have a google form so you can just fill in your name uh, over here 
and email address and uh, then you can ask a daytime astronomy question or a nighttime astronomy question or a career related question and we'll be really happy to take comments and feedback from you it will really help us improve our sessions so please click on the submit button once you ask your questions and uh, given your email id okay so with that um and yeah i forgot uh, one more point please mention the slide number we have slide numbers over here uh, for our talks so please mention the slide number during your questions so that we will be able to um, answer your questions by uh, putting the slides up as well so the first session uh, the daytime astronomy will be taken up by me uh, followed by the nighttime astronomy by my colleagues and they'll be talking about instruments that are used to build and observe the stars above so like i told uh, astronomers are more like detectives they have to sit far away and uh, analyze the crime scene from far so they can't go there they can't do any tweaking and how do we do that how do we generate theories and um, how do we uh, develop models and uh, simulations to match them with the real astronomical object i'll give you a brief example with uh, the daytime astronomy using our sun can i really do that the sun should be a boring star right so that's what most of us think but uh, that's not true the sun is really dynamic and it is the closest stellar laboratory that we have the closest stellar plasma laboratory that we have so this is the only star that we are able to resolve uh, to the finest details on the surface so it is very important for us to study the sun there are three main reasons basically so first is philosophy um every breath that you take or every plant that is growing or the breeze that is blowing is somehow uh, due to the energy that we have taken from the sun the second reason is like i told you statistics because sun is so close we will be able to study the sun as a star and apply this knowledge to all the other stars in our milky way galaxy and the third is fear so we are really afraid of things we are really afraid of the finite life that we will be living now how dangerous is the sun for us or is it really dangerous for us we'll be um seeing that as well and this is one more reason why we'll have to study the sun so let us start off uh, our uh, journey of understanding the sun with a simple analogy say for example um i have this uh, battery over here and uh, when i leave the battery it falls on the ground so the gravity is pulling this battery and it is making the battery go towards the center of the earth but then the battery falls on the surface of the earth and it stops there it is not going towards the center of the earth and why is that so that is because the electrons uh, in the atoms that make up this battery are having an electrostatic repulsion with the atoms uh, that are uh, the electrons of the atoms that are making up the flow okay so this cannot be applied for the sun the sun is too huge the amount of mass that the sun has is so much that uh, if the entire sun is packed together and if uh, electrostatic force was the only force that had to balance the sun the sun would get crushed due to its own weight so how is the core actually balancing the sun uh, this is due to the energy produced at the center of the sun by um, nuclear fusion so what happens is the um the at the core of the sun four hydrogen nuclei combine to form one helium nucleus now the total mass of this four uh, hydrogen nuclei is more than the uh, mass of one helium nucleus so this missing mass is what comes out as gamma rays and high energy photons of the sun so what basically is happening is the sun is having a downward uh, force due to gravity and radiation is pushing the sun back up so if you have to see how energetic this event is uh if you have a torch light and you switch it on the uh, photons fr coming from the torch light hits your palm and you can't see any light over here so what's happening to those photons is it's basically imparting momentum onto your uh, uh, onto the atoms in your palm now if you make the torch light brighter and brighter and brighter you will start feeling a slight push on your hand now you just imagine the number of photons required to slightly push your hand now scale that up to the sun 
so the whole weight of the sun which is um, uh, coming on the center of the sun uh, basically the core is being pushed outward just by light so just by radiation the gamma rays that are being emitted the entire weight of the sun is being balanced so the sun is in equilibrium where gravity is the inward force and the radiation is the outward force so the sun has three layers uh, the core the radiative zone and the convective zone the core is like what i told you the energy producing unit in the sun which will be 15 million kelvin so at that temperature you can have uh, hydrogen fusion then you have the uh, radiative zone so the energy transported in this zone is basically through radiation uh the plasma is so highly ionized that you will have random walk and the photons interact many times before it moves to the next step then the outer region is the convective zone so the convective zone the temperature drops somewhere from 2 million kelvin all the way to the surface of the sun which is like uh, 6000 kelvin so convection is what you see when you boil water or when you boil rice so when you're boiling rice you can see that the rice grains are like uh, going from the bottom of the pan they are going up and then they are going down again so this is due to convection where the heat from the bottom of the pan is taken to the surface it is dissipated there and it cools down and it goes back so the same thing happens in the convection zone now how do we know that i'll be telling you shortly before going there uh, i told that the sun has three layers right it has like the convective zone the radiative zone and the core so how do we know that we have never been to the sun it's uh, just like how we know the internal layers of the earth so we have we say that the earth has a crust it has a mantle it has a molten uh, uh, mantle it has the solid mantle the molten mantle and it has the core so how do we know that that is because of earthquakes whenever there is an earthquake you have seismic waves generated on the earth that propagates within the surface uh, i mean inside the surface and on the surface now this helps us analyze the surface of the i mean the interiors of the earth now uh, the sun is so dynamic due to nuclear fusion due to convection and uh, due to all this turmoil you have many frequencies produced acoustic frequencies but um, just like your guitar string when you pull a string only one note or its harmonics come out uh, based on the size of the sun only few frequencies are amplified now due to this you have these oscillations on the surface of the sun which are called uh, helioseismic oscillations and these oscillations again propagates through the surface of the sun and to the interiors which you can uh, see over here and based on this we have generated the structure like it has the convective zone the radiative zone the core so even without looking at what is there inside the sun we are able to deduce what the sun is doing and uh, the sun we are going to talk about the visible uh, surface where uh, we'll be talking about convection you uh, you might ask like uh, how do you know that the convection zone is the outermost layer so that is where we'll see the visible surface and uh, please be careful it's very dangerous to look at the sun directly so you'll have to wear protective glasses so when you look at the uh, visible surface which is called as a photosphere very close you can see some bubbling action so these are called granules and this bubbling action, action like i told you when you are boiling rice you can see rice going up and coming down it is very similar to that so that's how we know that the surface of the sun is having convection and um, these blobs are called granules and the size of these blobs might be like almost half the size of india sometimes or like even the entire uh, country of india or even bigger countries so we say that uh, on the surface we are seeing this bubbling action and it is due to convection now is that true uh, we have uh, a theory so we perform a simulation and you can see the simulated image over here and we have observation so we can see uh, the outcome over here uh, in the observation where we uh, see the granulation pattern which is same like the theory uh sorry same like the numerical simulation so from your uh, theory you developed a, um a numerical simulation which you are matching with the observation and they both are matching so the theory is right 
now the sun is really hot so most of what sun is made up of is plasma and uh, convection is the motion of plasma now if there is moving electric field then you should be generating magnetic field and that is true for the sun as well and sun is nothing but a giant uh, magnet now uh, if you i mean the magnetic field on the sun is around 1000 to 4000 gauss uh if you want to compare it, the magnetic field on the earth is like 0.5 gauss and uh, your normal bar magnet that you use like or that is present in the toys and all is like around 100 gauss so the magnetic field on the sun is 10 to 40 times stronger than that now if sun was just this if sun was just granulations and magnetic field being produced even i would have told it is a really boring star but uh, the interesting part starts from here uh due to differential rotation the uh, rate at which the equator moves is faster than the rate at which the poles move so sun is a big ball of gas and uh, because it is not a solid body each part of the sun can move at different rates so this image that i am showing you here is uh, the top view of the sun so if you are seeing the sun from north pole and uh, this is the north pole of the sun and this is the equator then you can see that the equator is moving faster than the poles now this is a artistic uh, simulation so this is not a real observation now this causes all sorts of interesting things i told you like the sun is a bar magnet right so due to this differential rotation what happens is it pulls those magnetic fields along and uh, it causes a twist and the magnetic fields actually come out so this is called as the omega effect because it forms a omega symbol kind of structure over here the magnetic field so what happens is the magnetic field which is inside it is being uh, due to the differential rotation it is being dragged and due to the convective motion due to the boiling the magnetic field which is inside the sun is being brought up to the surface so the magnetic field when it's brought up to the surface it comes out um, and forms an arc uh like the way you can see over here now the boiling rice example if you put a pipe in the boiling rice and uh, you allow the rice to boil for some time and then you remove the metallic pipe you will see that the location where the pipe was the rice is cooler and uh, the location where the pipe was not there where you had normal convection the rice is hot so the same thing must happen on the sun due to this magnetic field there is convective flow which is being restricted and due to that there is no heat energy which is taken from the bottom of the surface of the convective zone to the uh, topmost photosphere so it will be cool cooler this region and hence it will it should appear darker so that is what will be called as a sunspot and here is a simulation on how the magnetic field is coming out the omegas which are formed and the open you can see that the magnetic field lines are uh, opening up over here these cause some interesting phenomenon which i'll be explaining so with this omega effect we uh, simulated uh, i mean there are simulations done where uh, you have simple sunspots generated and is this how the sun behaves yeah we do have sunspots it is much more complicated on the sun but some of the very simple sunspots observed on the sun match very close to the uh, theoretical simulations that we have so again the theory that we formed and uh, the numerical simulation that we have is uh, related to the observations uh, that we make on the sun and because they are matching the theory of the omega effect might be true but we are not able to recreate the complexities so there might be many more effects involved here now because of this magnetic field sun becomes a really interesting object so it's not the interior of the sun which is interesting it is the exterior of the sun which is the solar atmosphere so the sun has the photosphere which is the outermost layer that we see then you have another layer called the chromosphere and then comes the corona so what is this chromosphere chromos uh, means crimson so when there were lunar eclipses sorry solar eclipses that were happening the when the moon was blocking the sun we used to see a crimson layer uh, of objects around the sun so due to this they called it a chromosphere and now we know that this is formed due to the hydrogen uh, balmer series emission and absorption that is happening 
and in this chromosphere we see many features like these filaments so why is it called a filament excuse me you have a bulb and you have a tungsten filament in it which is a thin wire like structure so if you see that this filament is also a thin structure on the surface of the sun so it's called a filament now if the same filament is observed at the limb you call it a prominence it will look like this it is prominent uh, beyond other features of the sun so it is called a prominence so these are the features that you observe in the chromosphere and the temperature in the chromosphere will be 4000 to 8000 kelvin then above the uh, chromosphere comes the corona so corona is a few million kelvin and you have many more beautiful phenomena happening there i told you like the magnetic field that is coming out from the surface of the sun goes all the way to the corona and it forms these coronal loops and coronal holes are like uh, pseudo monopoles so these are open magnetic field lines uh, from where you have charged particles going out from the sun now if you have noticed i told that the chromosphere is 4000 to 8000 kelvin the corona is a few million kelvin and the photosphere is 6000 kelvin uh, to get a better picture you can see this graph so the temperature of the photosphere i mean uh, once you move from an object which is generating heat as you go farther and farther away it should start becoming cooler right so once you start moving away from the photosphere towards the corona it should become colder and colder so it should be 6000 kelvin 3000 kelvin 1000 kelvin it should go down like that but if you see this graph it's going from 6000 it's rising to 8000 and then there is a huge jump and this region is called the transition region and then you have the corona which is a million kelvin so the temperature of the corona is same like that of the core of the sun but uh, a simple did you know fact if you cover the surface of the sun and uh, if you sit on the corona meaning there is no heat coming from the sun if you sit on the corona which is 15 million kelvin you will still freeze to death because the uh, the density of the corona is so low the rate at which you are receiving the heat energy is lesser than the rate at which you radiate out heat energy but this apart the corona is still 15 million kelvin so how is it possible there are a few theories one is like the waves uh, i told you the helioseismic uh, waves uh, on the sun which are ever present so they are, uh, i mean one theory is like these waves somehow dump the energy into the solar corona this is a theory again there are some simulations that are trying to be uh, the, that they are conducting and trying to match it with the observation then there is another theory um, which is uh, related to the um, magnetic field reconnection so you have these magnetic fields that are formed on the sun and i told you that the sun has differential rotation due to this the magnetic field of the sun breaks or forms and uh, this breaking or forming of the magnetic field uh, releases a lot of energy into space so you have solar flares which are in x ray domain then you have a coronal mass ejection that is happening uh, where you have a lot of mass being thrown out and they suspect that this might be another reason why the corona is heating up but all these are speculations so if you can see coronal mass ejection is nothing but um, a huge mass or chunk of um, plasma that is thrown into outer space so you can see over here sorry okay so um, sorry about that so yeah so um but then these explosive events are not very regular so uh, i told you that one of the reasons why the corona might be heating is because of the wave and the second reason why the corona might be heating is because of these reconnections but these reconnections are not so often and not energetic enough to keep the corona at 15 million kelvin all the time and uh, you can um, see that from the uh cartoon over here so these energetic events that i showed won't happen all the time they happen periodically so if you see over here the bar magnet of the sun uh, is being converted into this toroidal field so this is called the poloidal field because it's along the poles of the sun and toroidal 
it's along the equatorial region of the sun so what happens is the magnetic field is dragged and you form the omegas over here and you form the toroidal field and these toroidal fields combine together and eventually they line up to form the poloidal field again so the poloidal field over here undergoes a omega effect to form the toroidal field and then it goes an alpha effect to form the poloidal field again if you see that the field lines over here are you have a north pole below and south pole on top but if you see this image over here you have the north pole on top and south pole below so the poles are inverted and uh, this cycle takes 11 years and uh, again the cycle starts off once it goes to the poloidal field again you have the uh, omega effect which causes the toroidal field and again the alpha effect which causes the poloidal field so the flipping happens in 11 years and the magnetic field configuration gets back to the original position in uh, 22 years now um, this has been recorded as minima and maxima as uh, a solar cycle activity where you have solar maxima and solar minima so most of the activities uh, that you saw the coronal mass ejection etc happens during the maxima and uh, during the minima you don't have such strong magnetic field to produce uh, those huge magnetic reconnections so how is a corona so hot uh, one of the theories is nano flares so na they are speculations that you don't need such large magnetic fields but you have small scale reconnections on the surface of the sun that constantly pump energy into the surface of the sun so these are still theories and there are still simulations uh, associated with those theories and uh, we are conducting observations to see what it means the next solar cycle based on this 11 year uh, periodicity is like um, going to start off in 2020 and it's going to reach a peak in 2025 and uh, they are predicting that this will be the uh, activity activity or the number of sunspots that will be seen we must see if this prediction is going to come true now these energetic events also throw out a lot of particles into the interplanetary space so how does it affects the earth uh, the magnetic fields like interacts with the uh, earth and like um, due to this there will be reconnection on the earth surface and the charged particles if you see here will actually go and hit the earth's atmosphere and these charged particles when they interact with the earth's atmosphere uh, they excite the atoms in the earth's atmosphere basically the nitrogen and oxygen and uh, this excitation causes auroras so these are the reasons why you see aurora borealis in the northern hemisphere and aurora australis in the southern hemisphere and we broadly classify this as space weather for people uh, on earth it is not very harmful but uh, for astronauts in space and for satellites in space it is risky uh, astronauts will be um, exposed to radiation and uh, high energy uh, cosmic rays and uh, your uh, instruments on the satellites may undergo short circuiting because of these charged particles going in so it is always good that we predict the uh, incoming uh, solar uh, uh, events to warn the astronauts uh, on the incoming solar radiation or to switch off the electronics on your satellite to prevent it from having a short circuit so it is very important to study the sun and how it is behaving but how do we study it uh, it will be i mean astronomy i mean sorry instrumentation in general will be covered later in the night time astronomy but uh, a brief overview on what uh, uh, instrumentation happens for the sun is like the sun is a black body um, with uh, a peak um, at uh, 5700 kelvin and uh, that is not a important feature but sun has many absorption and emission lines due to the elements and it is these lines which are interesting for us to study so when we study these lines we will be understanding different phenomenon on the sun and not all radiation enters the earth surface so we will be only able to probe the visible light the infrared and the radio uh, the remaining wavelengths we will have to go to space like x rays or uh, ultraviolet or gamma rays or even to uh, measure the cosmic ray particles so this is an image um, by sdo a space based observatory so you can see sun in different wavelengths and each wavelength you see different features on the sun here you see sun spots here you see coronal loops and stuff like that so basically the instrumentation can be classified as imagers 
polarimeters and spectrographs images are the ones that generate images like this but uh, those images might not give you a lot of information that is when you have spectrographs and polarimeters so spectrographs um, um resolve your lines atomic lines so you can study the atomic lines much more carefully and polarimeter is used to uh, study the magnetic field on the sun like the magnetogram that is produced over here uses polarimetry for it and uh, you also have coronagraphic devices so like i told you the sun the moon blocks the sun and due to that you can see the chromosphere and the corona but you don't have to always wait for an eclipse to happen you can artificially create an eclipse by keeping a disk in front of the uh, instrument to create an artificial eclipse so which is what is shown over here uh, sorry which is what is shown over here so this in the center is the sun and all this is the coronal mass ejections from the sun and uh, multi wavelength studies are like a collaboration of space based instruments which uh, study the radiation uh, wavelengths which do not enter the earth surface and ground based observatories and you have balloon experiments aeroplane related experiments and sounding rockets which study the sun at different wavelengths and it is true for other astronomical objects as well so the true uh, strength of uh, studying the sun is like uh, this multi uh, messenger astronomy like uh, and multi wavelength astronomy where you study the sun in different wavelengths and you have probes which go uh, say for example like the nasa isa solar orbiter which will be imaging the solar uh, poles for the first time and nasa solar probe which will be going very close to the sun you have many facilities in india as well Uh, like the udaipur solar observatory uh, in rajasthan gauri bidnur observatory in uh, tamil nadu and kodaikanal observatory in uh, i'm sorry gauri bidnur observatory in karnataka and kodaikanal observatory in tamil nadu and uh, kodaikanal observatory in particular is very interesting because it's the oldest observatory for india and it has uh, 100 years of data if you want to study uh, the features of the sun and like um, different phenomenon happening on the sun you can go uh, click on this link and Uh, analyze the data you can also see the sunspot cycles that i talked about the 11 year cycles that happens on the sun and india has its own space based mission uh, the aditya l1 so this uh, will have seven payloads to uh, observe the sun and it will be placed in lagrangian point 1 it is a stable point between the sun and the earth where you can uh, keep the satellite with minimum fuel and you can keep observing the sun continuously so thank you for your uh, patience and uh, if you have any questions please ask us and before i end my talk i just want to thank somya supriya and uh, other people who helped in uh, producing these and um, uh, creating these slides thank you thanks mohan uh, it was really interesting talk so this is the time for question and answer session so so if you have any question please uh, right now in this sorry yeah in this get time astronomy section here and after writing your question please press the button submit then it will come to us and right now we will take couple of questions and if we can't answer all of your questions but don't hesitate just write your questions we will come back in the question and answer section in 3 so so there is a good questions by kartikeya choudhury Uh, it is uh, for the slide number twenty. The question is: Does the presence of open magnetic field lines tells about the existence of magnetic monopoles? So Atreya will answer this question. Hey, uh, yeah, thank you, Sajal. Uh, can you put up the slide twenty? okay um it's an interesting question kartikeya so um uh, yes uh, your observation is good so 
uh, we do say that sun has open magnetic fields, especially from the polar regions uh, and uh, some of the places like from coronal holes. Um, however, uh, we know from the fundamentals of electromagnetism and uh, especially the Gauss law, it says that magnetic uh, monopoles do not exist. Uh, and the del dot B, the divergence, the total flux through a closed surface must be zero. So, uh, uh, so having known that, so to answer that, what is this open fields are about? So the current understanding is these field lines, the solar sun is a, as Mohan mentioned, uh, a sun is a giant ball of uh, magnetized plasma. Um, which has uh, magnetic fields everywhere. It's a very complex system. Um, so the, the, the field lines which emanates, which we think that it's, uh, they are open fields, uh, they are indeed, they gets connected. Um, with, we believe that it gets connected uh, over a very large distance. These um, uh, magnetic field lines, they uh, across, across, they move across the interplanetary space. Uh, crossing across uh, various planets, and uh, uh, that's that's our current understanding. That uh, because that goes against when you say that monopoles exist, then they are uh, against our fundamental laws of uh, uh, physics. So currently, our understanding is these uh, field lines are pretty uh, long, and they are getting connected at some part uh, in the heliosphere. I hope that answers your question. Thank you. Thanks, Atre. And there is another question by uh, Anu Parpita. Can you please explain the difference between Aurora and Airglow? This will take by Shubham. Yeah, uh, yeah, nice question. So uh, Aurora are uh, when the uh, the polar re in, uh, it's uh, mainly seen in the polar regions. Uh, because the magnetic, the particles, the charged particles get funneled towards the polar regions of the Earth because of the Earth's magnetic field, and that's when you see the aurora. Whereas night glow uh, or air glow uh, is a universal phenomenon; it's not restricted to the poles. It essentially happens when uh, sunlight excites molecules in the Earth's atmosphere, and when they recombine uh, the. Uh, the recombination happens and a photon is uh, released. So the, the main component of air glow is comes from oxygen and that's what causes a faint greenish glow. So you won't see it from the cities because the light is dominated by uh, light pollution. But if you go to a remote site and especially if you do astrophotography, you will see a, a faint greenish glow in your image and that is air glow. Thanks. Thanks, Subham. Um, there is a question by uh, Adesh Thawale. Uh, it's about sunspot. Sunspots usually have a dark region surrounded by a lighter region, as seen in the photograph. Why is it so? So this question will take by Atre. Yeah, thank you. Um, yeah, it's an interesting question, Adesh. It's a very nice observation from the uh, images, which uh, Mohan showed. It is indeed interesting. So you see the sunspots appear darker. So these are all again the photospheric, which is the visible surface which you see. Um, uh, these are all the regions where um, the average temperature, which as Mohan covered, the photosphere is the visible surface. The temperature is around 5,000 to 6,000 Kelvin. Uh, whereas these regions where the magnetic field is more concentrated, which suppresses the convection, uh, that means the heat uh, reaching up to the surface is suppressed. So because of that, so these regions appear, these regions, the temperature of these regions are relatively uh, less compared to its surroundings. For example, the uh, the, the temperature around these, uh, inside these sunspot regions would be of the order of 3000 to 4000 Kelvin as compared to the temperature which is in the surroundings, which is around uh, 5000 to 6000 Kelvin. So when you look at it in the contrast, so which is the temperature map or temperature is nothing but the black body emission, the, temp uh, the light which is coming from that. So the light which is coming from these regions would appear uh, less intense compared to the surroundings. That's why they appear dark in the images. So again, uh, yeah, thank you for the question. I hope this answers. Thank you. Thanks, Atre. Uh, there is another question by Gauri Krishna. Gauri Krishna, uh, will 
sun would end its life as supernova? So this question will answer by Shubham. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So uh, you will learn more about this in the stellar part of the talk, which follow the which is going to follow. Uh, but the short answer is no. The sun is not going to end its life as a supernova, and the reason is it's not massive enough, uh, and so eventually the sun will. Uh, currently, the sun is in what we call as the main sequence, where it burns hydrogen in its core. And uh, once the hydrogen is extinguished, it will uh, transform into a red giant. And finally, the core will uh, shrink to a white dwarf, and that will be the end of the uh, sun's life. Thanks. Thanks, Subham. Uh, there is another question by Vishwajit. Vishwarajit, sorry. Uh, if sun have magnetic field, why coronal mass ejection occurs. Next question is, uh, and he also tried to answer that because magnetic field should oppose the plasma-like earth magnetic field. So to clear this confusion, uh, Atre will answer this question. Oh, this is really interesting. Yeah, thank you. Um, okay, uh, yeah, you're right. So sun is a, sun is a giant ball of uh, gas with magnetic field everywhere. So it is, um, it's the same reason why the plasma is getting out. So Earth is totally different from Sun. Sun is a full uh, a ball of gas, and it's full of ionized gas, which is nothing but in plasma. So these plasma are tied with the magnetic fields. And uh, when the magnetic uh, reconnections or the eruptive events happen, these plasma, which is, as you might have studied, the, the particles are moving around the magnetic field. They are completely tied to that. So they gyrate around the magnetic field. So what happens when uh, severe eruptions happen, these particles, which are accelerated uh, uh, in these magnetic fields, and they are getting thrown thrown out into the interplanetary space, and uh, which is way different from uh, the uh, way with which the Earth's uh, magnetic field works. So here, because the uh, the plasma is there inside the sun itself, and that is what is moving around with this uh, magnetic field, which is getting ejected. Yeah. And these, uh, to answer your question, why coronal mass ejection occurs? Again, uh, our current understanding uh, is basically, uh, as uh, Mohan showed, that uh, sunspots are these regions on the sun where there is a huge concentration of magnetic fields where the uh, the magnetic field lines are bunched together. So assume that you have a big tube where collection of many individual magnetic field lines, they are bunched together. So when you have such a bunch and imagine that each bunch has uh, lots of plasma which are moving around, they are tied to that. And now uh, when you have such a big flux tube, with the magnetic field lines. And what happens looks like, uh, along with that, imagine that it's a, like a rubber band, bunches of rubber band, and they are going uh, as uh, clearly uh, Mohan showed about the sunspot uh, uh, formation, how the shearing happens, the differential rotation, these uh, uh, elastic or these rubber bands or the flux tubes, they get sheared. So when they get sheared, there are a lot of things which would happen. So and these twisting and shear, they amount to uh, various phenomena. So one of them is uh, coronal mass ejection, where uh, a bulk amount of plasma is ejected into the space. And uh, some of our understanding uh, points to uh, having a reconnection or magnetic reconnection where uh, two magnetic polarities, they come close together and they short. So the, uh, when you have such uh, a phenomena occurs uh, on the solar corona, uh, it releases all the particles or it releases the energy which is stored. It basically like you keep the magnet uh, if, if you keep the rubber band, it is growing up and up and up, and then suddenly you release it when it, the amount of energy which is released, which you feel it on your hand, it's similar to that, how the energy is dissipated during coronal mass ejection. I hope this answers your question. Thank you. Thanks, Atre. It's a very nice way he explained that. So we'll take another question, last question for this section. Uh, this is uh, about helioseismology. This is Debika Karat. She wants to know a little more about this. So can you please brief about helioseismology? Mohan can answer this. 
Uh, hi, that's a nice question. So like um, I told in my talk, if uh, I can share my slides real quickly. Mm. Just a second. So you can see like you have this bright and dark, I mean the red and blue, red and blue patches. So the red patch can be considered to be um, the peak and the blue patch can be considered to be the valley. Now the rate at which these red and blue patches occur is the frequency at which these uh, waves ge are generated on the sun. So I gave you the example of the guitar string. So if you pull a string, it generates a particular frequency and its harmonics. Now, this frequency and harmonics are dependent on the thickness of the string, the length of the string, and where you the uh, where you place your finger, like while you're playing the guitar. Now, similarly for the sun, based on the size of the sun and based on its density, there are only certain frequencies that get amplified and that get sustained on the sun, and all the other frequencies die. So when you have this convection, you basically generate all the frequencies, but only those frequencies which are closed, which forms this closed loop survive. So that is what you see here on the surface of the sun. Now, these frequencies are, I mean, these waves or these modes travel throughout the sun, on the surface, inside the surface and everywhere. So if you have a mode that is generated here, you will try to see how long it takes for that mode to propagate to the other end of the sun. Now, based on the density of the sun and based on the inter internal contents of the sun, this wave can travel fast, it can travel slow, it can split into two parts. So using this, we will be able to map what is inside the sun. Um, another crude example is like uh, how BAT uses echolocation to see the objects around it, like to see the praise around it. So it is similar to that. So you use um, sound acoustics, you use seismology, basically waves to see the internal structure of the sun. I hope that clarified your doubt. Thanks, Mohan. Uh, now we'll shift to nighttime astronomy section. So student, please write your any questions and submit it and we'll get back to you in uh, third section of question answer section, okay? So don't hesitate. So now it will go to nighttime section. Hello, uh, my screen is visible. Yes, Sandeep. Okay, so, so hello, very good morning to all. So hope you had a good session with the daytime astronomy with where you have looked about uh, our nearest star. Uh, in this session, we will be looking about many more stars like sun, which is, which is uh, in a vast space, uh, which is much, much far away from us. And there are many, many interesting objects also. This is one of the objects, which is an uh, image you can see below is the black hole, the first uh, imaged black hole, which was uh, uh, imaged recently with the radio telescopes. And, uh, and there are many more such objects, uh, which I will try to cover. And then you will move to cosmology, origin of our universe. And then we'll move to the astronomical eyes, because our eyes cannot see the whole universe. So you need some kind of innovations. And the human mind is capable of doing this. And we have a lot of uh, a range of uh, telescopes, which can see uh, the vast universe. So. Before going into the universe, I just want to brief, brief about the, uh, I want to just brief about the land scale in our universe. So usually because the land scales which we deal in astronomies are very large. So, so we basically talk about light years, which is the amount of light, uh, amount of uh, distance a light travel in a year. This is roughly around 10 to the power 16 meter. You can see how big it is, and then you, uh, you when you start discussing about the stars, how is the nearest star, how closest uh, the nearest star is to us, which is the Proxima Century star, and 
uh, which is also very interesting. I will come about why it is very interesting to discuss pro Proxima Sense 2. And it is one parsec away, which is 3.3 light years. So this is another bigger scale. And then you have another scale, which is called one astronomical unit, which is the distance between sun and earth, and which you can type in around one millionth of a parsec. And yeah, nearest star I have already told, it's Proxima Century, which is one parsec away. And then our own galaxy, which is Milky Way, its diameter is around 30 kiloparsec. And uh, our sun is, uh, as we have seen in the previous talk, it's around eight kiloparsec from the center region. And I will come to more about Milky Way. Uh, and then our sister galaxy, which is uh, like our, uh, uh, similar to the mass and size ranges of Milky Way is the Andromeda galaxies, which you can see with the naked eye also. If you are uh, having clear sky, if you have luxury of this, having clear sky, if you are not in cities, it is around one megaparsec. And then all these galaxies uh, make a system which is we call super clusters uh, and Virgo cluster, which uh, which we are a part of. They are of 30 megaparsec sizes. So you can see that uh, we have a humongous sizes. And then uh, we would, would like to, and our uh, observable universe, which we see is 30 gigaparsecs. And you will hear more about our universe in the cosmology section, which will be discussed by Swagat. And then, uh, th because the distances are very large, so it is uh, it is also a uh, challenge to measure it correctly. Because uh, if you don't measure distance correctly, then uh, you will not be able to gauge the uh, vastness of our universe and the, even the objects also we will not be able to de uh, decipher correctly. So there we have a standard candles like. Uh, uh, we have a uh, standard of standard uh, methodologies from which we can get the distances. So for small distances up to uh, uh, ten uh, around one ten, one tenth of the uh, uh, par, one tenth to the minus five parsec range, which is you measure with the radar, which is kind of uh, in our solar system, or so we it's it's very small distance. And when you want to measure the distances in the, our galaxies, when you want to know the distance to a closer star, then you use the parallax method. It's like uh, uh, how the star moves, you just measure at different times. And you guess the how it has moved, and you, you can determine that how far it is from. It's just the perpendicular movement. From the perpendicular movement, you can get this distance. And then from uh, stellar evolutions, uh, which we understand uh, uh, by little amount, we can get these uh, distances up to 100 kiloparsecs. And then there are special kind of stars, which are called cepid stars, which can measure further distances. And then you have another method to distances, distance up to gigaparsec, which is around 10 is about nine parsec. We have white dwarf supernova, type 1a and there are another relation which relates the uh, light of a galaxy to the ma to the rotation velocity of galaxies and then you have a uh, hubble law which i think you will be uh, which tells us how the uh, galaxies move from from us uh, um, so farther they are they move uh, faster and from which we can get uh, get the distances to very large scales. And you will come to this, I think, in cosmology section in more detail. So these are also called uh, standard candles. So yeah, so to to just uh, to make you realize that these distances need to be measured very correctly, uh, let me go into the Milky Way history. Uh, so we just didn't know about that Milky Way is a circular thing, uh, which I showed in the first slide, uh, which is, uh, OK, I will go later. So, so Milky Way is uh, galaxies, and Galileo told that uh, galaxy is nothing but it's a congeries of many innumerable stars, which are distributed in clusters. And when the first, uh, first uh, 1.2 with the 1.2 meter telescope, Herschel measured this uh, first map of the star galaxy. He just measured the distance of the star in uh, in the all the directions, and he came up with this map. And this was uh, pretty far from the correct image. And we will know that why it was wrong. 
but uh, then slowly the things progressed and captain measured this kind of map which was which was around 17 kiloparsecs in the length side and it has thickness of about 3 kiloparsecs so it was the 20th century one so in both the galaxies our sun was at the center but which is not the case why it was in the center because uh, there is uh, something called dust which is present vastly in the interstellar medium and if you don't take care account of this because uh, uh, to measure the distances you need intrinsic light of the uh, any star if you don't measure this uh, uh, star uh, light properly then you will not be able to guess the uh, distance correctly so these are the reason that sun was in the central region so in 1920s there was a great debate about the what is the shape of our galaxies and we were uh, we were we were having only similar uh, similar pictures till that time so uh, this uh, debate uh, generated a lot of uh, uh, insight for our galaxy so there was uh, this uh, this debate was between two person mainly harlow shapley and these were the great great scientists at that time and curtis so so uh, during that uh, observations there was uh, this kind of uh, uh, nebulas which was uh, not stars uh, uh, it was little fuzzy things so it was observed in the galaxies and um, the main question was what are these are these within our galaxy or are they outside of our galaxy so shapley mentioned that these nebulas are are part of our home galaxies and our universe is only limited to our galaxy that means and curtis uh, debated that uh, they are independent galaxies which are so that means our universe is very very big so so yeah so curtis was right in this sense and uh, to put it in this context uh, so this kind this debate is a centenary debate and this year's debate is going to be on extraterrestrial life this year only so dates will be announced you guys can uh, See, you can follow up if you are interested in these. These are very interesting debates, and we know very little about extraterrestrial life. So I will come about this. So what we know about our galaxy. So current understanding of our galaxy. Uh, there in the image you see the face-on view. If you see from the top of the galaxy in the polar region from the galaxy, and this is the side view. So you can see that uh, our uh there is a central bar region and there is a little bulge also there which you can see more pronouncedly in the side on view and there are spiral images uh, what is it, spiral structures also there and there are star formation dusts and all these things are within our galaxy and uh, when you see from the side on you see there is a kind of a stellar halo which uh, contains globular cluster stars which are thought to be formed in the beginning when the galaxy formed and these are the newly formed star which is within the disk and uh, there is uh, one more thing which we cannot see which is the uh, which is called dark matter which is surrounding this uh, our galaxy and this only we can feel through rotation curves and which was uh, uh, first detected by vera rubin in 1970s so yeah so this was the part we we cannot see with the telescopes but we can uh, through the dynamics we can understand so let me go through the what are the uh, as we know that there are many many more galaxies in our universe and uh, so how do we classify them so are these only this uh, disk galaxies no there are uh, several shapes of galaxies it comes with the different uh, properties so there are elliptical galaxies uh, which are classified by hubbles in this nice pattern so so that we can study them nicely so uh, uh, here the ellipticity increases and you have e0 to e5 and up to s0 you have a lenticular which is also called s0 galaxies which has a slight disk but bulge is more prominent so they are more uh, elliptical shapes and, and there are another uh, the, in the disk there are two types of galaxies um, both also called spiral galaxies so in one galaxy you see uh, bars so in the central region you can see bar which you saw in our milky way galaxy also has bar so it's a spc type so as you in, as you go from sa to s 
A to SC, the spiral arms kind of diverges out, so it opens up. And another category is unbarred galaxies, where you don't see bar, only the spiral structures. So now in the simulate, uh, so in the galaxies which we observe, people are also uh, able to, uh, what you say is, they are able to simulate the galaxies with the real galaxies. So this is a, one of the nice system, which is M51 system. And here you can see that uh, uh, you, you can nicely able to produce in the computers. You just put the star particles and the gas particle, and you can match the, all the spiral features. So in this system, one galaxy is kind of uh, trying to tidally interact with the major galaxies. And uh, let me go into the life of a star very briefly about. So, so this diagram, you see that uh, temperature is increasing in right side and luminosity is increasing uh, in the upper side. So stars are basically formed from a cloud or nebula, which is basically hydrogen. And as stars uh, starts to evolve, they evolve in the main sequence. They start burning hydrogen. In the main sequence, they burn hydrogen. And they evolve into the higher stages, giant and supergiant, when they burn the higher elements. And uh, after, uh, so the sizes of this are very large. You can relate with the luminosity and temperature. So for a constant temperature, if you see, uh, as your luminosity increases, the radius will increase. So these are very big, and these are very small. So in the end phase of the star, as, the, as there was a previous question in the last session, that uh, if the mass, of, the mass of the core is below eight solar mass, then the star will form white dwarfs or neutron, dwarf, neutron stars. And if it is greater than that, then it will form black holes. So white dwarfs are also very compact objects uh, because you can see luminosity is very low and radius is of the order of the uh, Earth radius. So how do we detect transient which uh, supernova when they occur? Just to give you a brief uh, flavor of the observations. So this is one of the images of a galaxy which was taken at some time. And then there was another image uh, which was taken at some other time. And uh, there is a one difference which you can observe is this uh, mental, uh, this spot, this bright, which was not there after some time. And when you re uh, reduce the, this one of the images, and you will find that this is the transient object, which are very interesting to observe. So, so let me just go to uh, uh, about uh, exoplanets, which are uh, like uh, there are many more systems like uh, ours in uh, our solar system in other stars. Uh, this is one of the trans Trappist system, and. Uh, in the planet, so planetary worlds outside our solar system, so they are around four, more than 4,000, and we are still counting. And how we detect them, there are many, uh, there are very interesting methods. One of the method is the transit method, in which, like, when a planet is rotating around this uh, star, then there is a slight uh, dip in the uh, luminosity of star. Because of that, you cannot, uh, you cannot. Uh, you can just kind of uh, observe this and there are many more uh, many more uh, this kind of methods which are radial velocity and direct imaging and there is a recently uh, observed star which is the which is uh, proxima century which uh, which is very close to us and uh, day before yesterday there was a uh, discovery of earth like planet which is you can follow up it's very interesting to see and there are uh, uh, other imp uh, other uh, interesting objects in our night sky, which are active galactic nuclei, nuclei. and I will just go very uh, fast because of shortage of time. So, so these are the objects which uh, emits a lot of uh, 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 what you say jets in very large distance, and they are very luminous around 10 to the power 15 times uh, sun luminosity, and they radiate in all the wavelengths, which is from radio to gamma rays. And they are also variable, and they are also so different uh, radi different wavelength has different formation mechanism, synchrotron, in inverse Compton, and thermal emission. So there is also something uh, interesting in this uh, black hole merging events or neutron star merging events, which we call multi messenger astronomy because it's a very new field originated after. 2015, the first detection of the first detection of this uh, merger of two black holes, 
which was a which was a kind of a new window to our uh, our observations and this is uh, the one of the event observed in 2017 which show, which gave us uh, idea about the uh, that these are uh, these are not only observed in the uh, what you say gravitational waves but they are also observed in the electromagnetic spectrum which was also seen and this is the electromagnetic counterpart of this gravitational wave and uh, so this gives us a lot of insight of formation of higher elements from uh, uh, iron so uh, uh, the elements uh, heavier than iron can be formed from this uh, uh, this process this was confirmed and uh, there are very other there are many more questions in the this uh, uh, this field which are how galaxies formed and evolved and then we have uh, how the uh, transit events like fast radio burst occurs and what causes them and how do binary star evolves and is there any habitable exoplanet and uh, how the intermediate mass black hole mass forms so these are the questions which are still unanswered i think uh, these are uh, things where we can contribute more okay so now i we will move to cosmology section so i will ask swagat to hello yes can hear you is, is the sharing visible yes it's visible you can make it full screen yeah so uh, hello everyone uh, in this uh, session i am going to talk to you about uh, cosmology um, cosmology is uh, one of the oldest uh, of disciplines that human beings have studied uh, it's about the origin and evolution and fate of our universe and and since last several thousand years uh, cosmology has made a journey from uh, being a being a part of a mythology to a part of concrete uh, precisely measured observationally and theoretically studied science uh, so uh, in the in the last talk uh, we we saw uh, what our universe is made up of uh, on smaller scales and larger scales i just want to uh, remind you that at very small scales uh, scales much smaller than 1 mm we see particles we see atoms uh, we see molecules uh, inside the atom we see nucleus and uh, electrons and then we see protons and neutrons and they are further made uh, made up of quarks so uh, this, this is the realm uh, where where uh, the nuclear forces and the electromagnetic forces hold the atom together okay so this this the systems are held together by by these kind of nuclear forces and electromagnetic forces and we apply quantum mechanics or quantum physics to study it uh, similarly if you go to uh, large scales scales greater than thousands or 10000s of uh, kilometers you see planets solar system stars um, stellar clusters globular clusters galaxies clusters of galaxies and then whatever it means to say the entire universe uh, this is the realm uh, since since the distances are so high and most of the objects are electrically neutral so they are mostly held by uh, gravitation gravity uh, holds them together uh, so th this this is where we apply einstein theory of relativity sometimes also Uh, newton's theory of gravity to understand the universe so uh, over the next 10 minutes what you are going to see is that both of these things even the small scale physics as well as the large scale physics is important to understand the entire universe so let's uh, see what do we know about the universe as as it is today if, if we want to see suppose we have a bird eye view of the entire universe how should it look today uh, you saw this uh, uh, diagram from sandeep stock Uh, this this is a small patch in the sky very little it, its angular size is almost similar to angular size of moon and so in in a small patch if you focus your a good telescope right like a hubble space telescope uh, and expose it for several hours or for several days what you're going to see is about 10000 or more galaxies even in a small patch so it seems like the universe is a is a swarm of galaxies okay now if you zoom out a little more and see it in a little more bird eye view uh, what you are going to see suppose you look in two diagonally opposite directions you are going to see this kind of 
dotted net like structure okay uh, where you see a lot of dots and then you see a lot of gaps black color gaps each dot here is a galaxy okay so this universe looks like some kind of a uh, a spider web a three dimensional spider web uh, which has uh, clusters clusters of galaxies which has gaps which are voids and then there are some filamentary structures uh, you can see it better in the next diagram if i zoom in a small part uh, if i take this and zoom in a very small part of uh, this this spider web structure and uh, then i'm going to see like this here each white dot is a galaxy and then you can see there are some voids okay or empty gaps so this is how this is how our universe looks today if, if we could see it in a bird eye view but uh, is it is it the case that universe always looked like this uh, the answer is no the reason is because of the following uh, if you look at all the far away galaxies from us if we just leave out all the nearby galaxies which are clustered together uh, to uh, to our milky way galaxy like andromeda and the magellanic clouds and few others you see all the far away galaxies and they all seem to go away from us uh, how do we know that we know that from their red shift uh, the fact that if a source is going away from you uh, then the light uh, that you observe the wavelength of the light that you observe is uh, higher than or longer than uh, the wavelength with which it was emitted okay so we see all the galaxies which are far away from us doing this same job so suppose it was emitted as a yellow color light what you observe is probably infrared or microwave or radio wave depending on where how far it is so in in fact this was observed first time by edwin hubble in 1929 but this was a generic prediction of einstein's theory of relativity um it was uh, einstein's theory when it was applied to the entire universe so in, in einstein's theory of gravity if you take all sorts of material and smear out all over the universe uh, then the theory predicts that either this material which you have smeared out it, either it's going to compress or it's going to expand depends on what is the initial condition so initially if you throw it out by, by some mechanism they're going to expand it may expand forever but or it may expand and stop and come back we'll see it um, but this is what was predicted uh, by uh, alexander friedman and uh, george s lemaitre uh, in the 20s early 20s and hubble observed it as the hubble's law uh, which shows uh, in the y axis i plotted the uh, the speed at which these galaxies are going away and uh, the x axis is the distance and we see that the further they are the faster they are moving okay and since it was predicted from theory we know what this expansion means it doesn't mean that space is there and galaxies are moving out from some particular point it, it, it doesn't mean that what it means is that uh, if, if we have bunches of galaxies like clusters of galaxies uh, then the space in between them is getting stretched uh, by einstein's theory which allows for space to get stretched or compressed uh, which is what i show here in this animation uh, that uh, the nearby bunches are coming together but all the other bunches are going away from each other okay so because the space between them is expanding which is also shown here that initially a lot of galaxies were very close by and then therefore the run forth this is how our universe is expanding and it has been expanding like this for at least 13.8 billion years um, what i have plotted here in this graph is that uh, uh, the size of the universe sort of if, if you take any two far away galaxies very very far away how the distance between them is changing okay uh, as a function of time and what you see is that the distance is increasing okay this green color curve is showing that distance is increasing uh, initially it seemed like the distance was increasing but the velocity was velocity of expansion was slowing down uh, it's because whatever made the universe expand in the first place gave it a velocity by which the universe started expanding but because of all the material there is attractive gravity between them so as they expand it try to uh, slow down because of this attractive gravity however we have observed that recently universe has started accelerating um which is a amazing discovery which happened in 1998 so it's as if uh, they were slowing down because of attractive gravity and somehow there was some uh, repulsive gravity which came into play in in the space which made all the system go faster and faster which is which is a little weird but this is what happened uh, and we call this whatever this repulsive gravity substance is we call it uh, dark energy okay uh, so this is how our universe is expanding uh, in fact the details of how our universe will expand even though one may not know einstein's theory of uh, relativity or gravity can understand it by simply understanding how a particle climbs a hill okay so if you have a ball and you throw it on the hill how it is going to climb the hill for example and this the, the shape of the hill is going to be decided by what kind of matter you put in the universe for example 
in the universe, you put a lot of atoms and molecules and galaxies. Galaxies are made of atoms and molecules. And if you put dark matter, which Sandeep talked about, uh, and also some light, photons, okay? Then the shape of the hill is like monotonically increasing and flattening. So on such a hill, if you initially throw a ball upward, the ball is going to go up, 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 depending on your speed. If the speed is high enough, it is never going to stop. It is going to up, 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 and never stop. It's always going climbing up. So this is what may happen to the universe. It may always expand. Or it may stop somewhere and start coming down. If the speed is lower, so it may just expand for a while, stop, and come, come back. This coming back and collapsing is called uh, uh, big crunch. Okay? And the initial speed with which it expanded is called big bang. Okay? Uh, maybe in the question answer session, I can clear some of these questions, what, what exactly Big Bang means. But uh, this is what we know, that it, it, it has been expanding. Okay? However, we also saw that universe started accelerating recently. Uh, so if you put repulsive gravity into Einstein's theory, this, the shape of the hill changes. Uh, so it was going up, then the hill starts sloping down. So if, if that happens, then the ball will climb up, up, up. But uh, as it crosses this uh, top maximum point, it's going to fall very fast. And that's how universe starts accelerating. Okay. So, so here the position of this ball is sort of like size of the universe. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> so as universe expands, there are all sorts of matter in the universe. This matter is going to get diluted because of the expansion. Okay. In particular, uh, radiation, which is photons mostly. Uh, in the early, early times, also neutrinos were also like radiation. Uh, they fall off as the size to the power fourth, one by size to the power fourth. So if, if, so if universe expands by two times, uh, they will fall by two to the power four times, okay, the density of radiation. While the density of uh, matter, including dark matter and galaxies, is going to fall as one by size to the power three. But the density of this uh, repulsive gravity substance, whatever it is, we call it dark energy, is sort of almost like a constant. Either it is exactly a constant or it is almost a constant. And so since it remains almost constant, it's going to dominate late, late in the universe. So that's why today we see that universe is being dominated by this repulsive gravity and it's, it has started to accelerate. Okay? Uh, if this theory is correct, if, if we can trust Einstein's theory, whatever it is predicting, then what would happen is that if you go back in time, all the galaxies which are far away today will be close to each other. So universe will be extremely hot and dense and in a extremely hot dense plasma state. Okay, All the galaxies will be on top of each other and the temperature will be so high uh, that uh, universe would not exist in uh, neutral atom state. All the atoms will be ripped apart from the nucleus and all the electrons, the electrons will be ripped apart from the nucleus and they will be moving around in the universe. So the, the whole universe would look uh, something like interior of our sun. Okay, You saw the talk on sun, it's a plasma. Our universe would also look like a plasma, but everywhere. Uh, in the universe, okay? So if this is true, then plasma traps light. That's why you cannot see the center of our sun. So if light gets trapped inside this, uh, in the universe, it is not able to travel much because it's hitting the electrons all the time. And then universe was opaque, okay? So you can't see very far. It will be like a fog, very dense fog, but it was expanding. So as it was expanding, it will cool down. Slowly, the temperature will go down and electrons will start uh, moving around protons or nucleus and then slowly atoms would be formed. Once the atoms are formed, then light can just pass easily. Uh, you can see me even though there is air in this room because light mostly pa passes unaffected through atoms. Uh, so then for the first time, light could travel in the universe. Okay? So this first light, uh, which is usually called as rem remnant heat, heat from, the, uh, from the hot Big Bang phase, this plasma phase is called hot Big Bang phase. Okay? Uh, so we should be able to see this light. And since it came from a lot of uh, collisions with electrons before it started traveling, it should also be a black body radiation. Such a prediction was made in uh, 1940s by George Gamow and his collaborators. And it, it was uh, discovered uh, accidentally sort of uh, by uh, two radio engineers, uh, Penzias and Wilson in 1964, for which they were awarded the Nobel Prize. <clears throat> So, uh, so this light, when it was emitted, it was very hot. Like I told you, it was like interior of sun. So it was more than 3000 degrees of Celsius. But uh, since universe has been expanding and cooling, this light became cooler and cooler as it came to. So today this light is only 2.7 Kelvin. So it's like minus 270 degrees Celsius, very low temperature. And when it was emitted, it was mostly yellow light, yellow color light. But since we know as universe expands, wavelengths get stretched. 
So this yellow light became microwave light. So we see it as a microwave background light coming from everywhere in the sky. And it fits a perfect black body radiation. This uh, solid curve is a black body radiation curve from theory and these dots are data points. Okay? So this was verified. Uh, much later, uh, th there was a Kobe mission. It's a satellite mission in the 90s, uh, which looked at all directions in the sky to see if, if the temperature is same. And uh, up to four digits uh, in decimal places, if you measure the temperature, it's 2.7255 Kelvin. So the whole, whole uh, sky would look a particular color. This green color doesn't mean light would look green. It's microwave. Just, just the color says the intensity of light in different directions. But if you have a better resolution camera, uh, which can see up to five digits, then you are going to see some temperature variations. There are three different missions. You see the last mission on the right plank has even better angular resolution. So you see. So what you see is this blue and red and green, whatever the spots colors are, they represent cold and hot spots. So there are some spots which are cold, some spots which are hot. And the difference, temperature difference between them is in the fifth decimal place. So it's the temperature difference is probably 0 0.00001, which is pretty small. So it's almost smooth universe early times, but there were small uh, differences from here to there. Uh, so, uh, and we also saw today, so this was in the past, uh, this universe must have from this hot dense plasma phase must have cooled to form today's universe, which is this clumpy uh, spider wave like structure. So how did this structure form? Uh, initially, uh, we saw this temperature fluctuations uh, in this cosmic microwave background sky, which means there were temperature fluctuations in the plasma. So as the plasma cooled to form neutral gases, the neutral gases would initially have these uh, small fluctuations. At the, uh, and they start in the first left-hand side box as small fluctuations. And if you leave these fluctuations to evolve under gravity, gravity is, wherever there was a little high density, gravity is going to compress it over the period of 13.8 billion years to form the today's clumpy uh, structure, the wave-like structure. Okay. So it's gravity which forms the structure, but it requires, uh, yes, uh, this is true, but only thing is it requires an extra ingredient, which is dark matter, because if I don't put dark matter uh, into the universe, it is not going to be this clumpy by 13.8 billion years. So you need something like, so what is a dark matter? A dark matter is a substance which is probably made up of some particles and uh, they, they, they don't mostly interact uh, uh, with light. Their only job is to just get compressed and clumpy. So they form some kind of a skeleton of the universe, which helps the universe to get clumpy over the period of time. Okay. So this is the story of the structure of the universe. There were tiny fluctuations in the early universe. They were amplified by gravity with the help of dark matter. And over 13.8 billion years, they formed the structure of galaxies and spider wave. The spider wave is called a cosmic wave, by the way. <clears throat> so there is another question. So what formed these initial fluctuations in the, in the universe? Why were there these initial fluctuations, temperature fluctuations, which I showed you? Uh, we don't know for sure what it was. All we know is this was due to quantum mechanics and our best scenario is called cosmic inflation, which came before this hot dense plasma phase. Okay, so before this hot big bang phase, there was a phase in which universe had mostly uniform energy. There were no particles. And this uniform energy was making the universe expand at an accelerated exponential rate. And this is somehow related to uh, the, the quantum mechanics, quantum physics acting during this phase is related to how these fluctuations are created. Maybe I can talk about it more in the question uh, answer system. Okay, so, the, so as universe expands, the relative uh, composition of the universe is changing, as I showed you, because uh, radiation fall at a different rate, matter fall at a different rate, dark energy is almost constant. So today we see almost 68% of dark energy and 27% sort of, uh, of dark matter and 3-4% of normal matter. Uh, while if you go back about uh, eight, uh, about 13.8 uh, 13 billion, 13 billion years ago, uh, when, when the age of the universe was probably a few uh, uh, hundred thousand years, what you will see is there, is there was mostly matter, almost no dark energy, and some amount of radiation, and some amount of atoms and neutrons. Okay. And if you go back even uh, further to a time when universe was sm smaller than, or age was smaller than uh, 60,000 years, then universe would be mostly radiation dominant. So our universe was sort of, I wouldn't say started off, but in the very early times, it was made up of mostly radiation. Uh, and as universe expanded, radiation density fell and it, it was matter dominated for a while. And then now it is dark energy. <clears throat> uh, so I, I'm going to give you a take home message from this talk. Uh, the take home message is that our universe has a history. It's an evolved.
evolving universe it's not static exactly 100 years back we did not know this fact okay 100 years back people thought universe is static and the first friedman uh, theory that universe could be expanding came actually in 1922 so we didn't know it a century back now we know we have a detailed view of the universe that if we go to a time when uh, universe was about 3 minutes old or maybe 1 minute old uh, universe was mostly made up of nucleus and electrons and uh, protons uh, and uh, neutrinos uh, and light they were all floating around in the plasma and as universe expanded the plasma cooled and the first light was emitted sort of around when universe was uh, 3 lakh 80000 years old and since then uh, because of these fluctuations there were some density fluctuations which were getting amplified by gravity and finally the today structure of galaxies stars planets every, everything uh, form so we owe our uh, structure in the universe in fact our origin to this fluctuations which present in the early universe okay uh, so the composition is dark matter dark energy uh, normal matter uh, it, it's usually said in public talks that uh, 95% of the universe is dark and i want to emphasize that this concept is time dependent and it's a bit uh, it's a little misleading to stress that we don't understand 95% in fact if you go to early universe it was mostly radiation and we sort of understand for a while we sort of understand almost 100% of the universe Okay. Uh, th there was of course dark matter, uh, but it was much smaller. The density was much smaller than radiation. So dark energy is dominating today. So only today it's ninety-five percent dark with dark matter and dark energy. Uh, um, in sixties, cosmology was not a well-respected part of uh, science. Um, cosmology uh, lev landau was an obelary it considered that cosmologists are often in error but never in doubt uh, but by 21st century cosmology is a very precise science and it is beating particle physics at some, uh, in the measurement uh, precise measurement at some for for some aspects of it okay and this is jim people who gave us there were there were thousands of scientists who helped us to understand this but jim people jim people was one of the main guys who helped us to understand the standard picture of the universe and so he was given nobel prize for his theoretical work in cosmology uh, in 2019 i want to leave you with uh, open questions in cosmology there are a lot to know what is this dark matter uh, what is this dark energy what created this initial fluctuations in the universe Uh, why universe started expanding at all what is big bang who started big bang was there anything there before big bang or it was the beginning uh, then why universe has only matter there is no anti particles we don't see a lot of positrons we don't see a lot of uh, anti protons what is what, why is it the case can we trust einstein's theory at very high energies in the early universe uh, and what is the fate of our universe is it going to expand forever like i show you it's it's accelerating now so is is it going to stop or is it going to accelerate forever and universe is going to die in a cold death so these are things to uh, uh, think about in future thank you uh okay uh i'm trying to i'll try to share my screen now uh am i audible and is my screen visible yes yes sir okay so hi uh, my name is arun and in the previous talks you have learned a lot about the universe about stars galaxies exoplanets but how do we study them and for this we use telescopes and instruments attached to them and this is what i will be talking about now so we look at the universe at different wavelengths of light or what we call colors and depending on the wavelength of light we are looking the type of telescope we use and where it is placed is also different atmosphere also plays a big role in this because it absorbs light waves differently at different wavelengths for example gamma rays x rays and most of the ultraviolet uh, rays are blocked by the upper atmosphere so all the telescopes that observe at these wavelengths are put in space visible light and uh, infrared light part of the infrared uh, light 
passes through the atmosphere. So we have optical observatories that are placed in Earth and they observe in these wavelengths. For most of the radio waves, the atmosphere is transparent. So radio teles uh, telescopes, which are usually large dish antennas or arrays of antennas are also set up in Earth. Now, observing in different wavelengths reveal different details about the objects in the sky. For example, if you look at the Milky Way in visible wavelength, it looks a bit blotchy, right? You see all these dark spots. This is because of the gas and dust between the stars that block the visible light. But if you go to longer wavelengths, for example, here in infrared wavelength, all that light gets to cruise through and not be absorbed. So looking at the universe at different wavelengths reveal different things about the universe. So let's talk about telescopes now. So a telescope works by gathering light. You could think of it as like a bucket in a rain. The telescope bucket collects light and the bigger the bucket, the more rain, or in this case, uh, the more light you will collect. A bigger bucket will also collect enough water from even a small drizzle. And in the case of telescope, this means that it will collect light from very faint or dim objects in the sky. So when we see light from galaxies very far away, we are also observing light that was emitted very long ago, right? So in some cases, very billions of years ago. So in this way, telescope can be also thought of as a time machine which, uh, through which we are peeking into the past because light takes so much time to travel to us. A second property, this is the light gathering property of the telescope. A second property of the telescope is the resolution. So what is resolution? So it is the ability to resolve or separate the details in what we are observing. So this image on the left is two light sources which are very close to each other observed by a smaller telescopes. And we cannot uh, like distinguish these two spots. But when seen through a larger telescopes as seen in the right, you could distinguish these spots. So this is the uh, property of the telescope called resolution. And both of these properties, the light gathering property and the resolution, both increases with the size of the telescope. The bigger the telescope aperture, the more details you are able to see and more fainter you are able to see. So the telescopes that you, you can usually buy from a shop or order, like usually looks like this. On the left is a refracting type of telescope with lenses. And on the right is a reflecting type of telescope with uh, mirrors. And uh, so, but the uh, telescopes that astronomers use, professional astronomers use, looks a bit different and sometimes are a bit bigger also. So this is the Indian Astronomical Observatory located in Hanle, a small village uh, near Leh in Ladakh. And it is one of the most active observatories in India right now. As you can see, most of the astronomical observatories are located in high altitude. You can see these mountains. And one of the reasons for this is to reduce the effect of atmosphere when you're observing. Uh, as you saw that uh, by atmosphere absorbs a lot of light. So when you go to higher altitudes, you reduce the effect of it. So the other use is that when you are located more remote locations, you also have less light pollution. Remote locations uh, have less light pollution. Uh, and uh, by light pollution, I mean the contamination from artificial lights. So this is one of the main reasons why you're not able to see a lot of stars in the night skies above cities because of the city lights. So also most of the observatories prefer a drier uh, air because of the absorption from water vapor. Now let's come to the telescopes themselves. Most of the optical telescopes in ground-based astronomy looks like this. So it's not like the previous telescope I've showed you. So they use mirrors. So you can see the mirror here. And this is a secondary. And these uh, telescopes are placed inside a dome to protect them. And what do you see? The blue box. So these are ports where instruments get attached. So telescopes use instruments to gather data. And these instruments come in different uh, classes, like uh, you already heard about imager, spectrograph, polarimeter. So imager and spectrograph are two commonly type used uh, instruments. So what is an imager? 
uh, you could think of an image as a camera that takes pictures of the night sky. So these are like regular camera, but are designed for astronomy. By which I mean that they use sensors like shown here, which are like uh, charge coupled devices. And the use of these sensors is to reduce the amount of noise in images. So uh, this is an image. And you know a spectrograph that splits the light into its uh, inherent wavelength. So you know already a prism does this, but in astronomy we use a diffraction grating, which looks like this, which does this job more effectively than a prism. And you can see the stellar spectra from something, uh, devices like this here with absorption lines. So we talked about uh, a lot about deep telescopes, right? One second, sorry. Yeah, so we talked about how we want big uh, telescopes, but how big are the current telescopes? It again depends on the type of telescopes. I'm showing two optical telescopes which are among the biggest in the world. Both are around 10 meter class telescopes. Uh, the first one is the Keck telescope in Hawaii. And the other one is the GTG uh, telescope in Spain. Both are 10 meters. And for the Keck telescope, you could see the hexagonal segments uh, that make up the primary mirror. So these big mirrors of 10 meter size are made up of small hexagonal segments that are combined to form a large mirror. And this one is the fast radio telescopes. So this is a radio telescope, which has a dish, a single dish uh, telescope of the size of 500 meters. And the, an important interesting fact about this is that this whole dish and dish was built on a, a depression in a mountain valley. So the curvature of the valley were used to have the surface of the dish. So it's a very interesting fact about this telescope. So we know how big uh, current telescopes are, but how awesome are they? And the answer is that they are pretty awesome. We have already done so much science with them. For example, you heard that we have already discovered existence of around 4,000 exoplanets. And we use different techniques to uh, detect these exoplanets. One of the techniques is using a uh, this transit technique where when a uh, exoplanet passes in front of the star, there is a, a small dimming of the star, which can be detected by an imager. And we can also use spectrographs to detect exoplanets. So when a uh, exoplanet uh, revolves around the star, there are like these small wobbles of the, uh, in the star and these small wobbles get recorded in the, as shifts in the absorption lines in the spectra. So the spectra shifts a little bit and these shifts in the spectra can be used to detect these exoplanets. So while we are discussing exoplanets, this is another amazing result from, uh, from one of the most used instruments these days, which is called a stellar coronograph. So this technique involves blocking the light from the central star to reveal the planets around it. So this particular star is around 100 light years away from us. And it's amazing to see how much far we have come in terms of technology and innovation that we are in a stage to take pictures of planetary systems of other stars. So, the other one of the results uh, that you may have heard about is this image of the black hole in the center of the galaxy M87. This observation is interesting because it was done by combining many radio telescopes around the world to function like a single telescope with almost the size of the Earth. And these uh, observations were synchronized using uh, very precise atomic clothes. And it's very fascinating to see the technology involved in imaging these telescopes. So the bottom, you can see all the radio telescopes that were used for this particular observation. So if uh, we have amazing telescopes now, what is coming? There are bigger and better telescopes and instruments that are gonna come in this decade. And I'll just briefly touch upon a few of these in very exciting projects. 
So first of these exciting facilities is the James Webb Telescope, which is planned to be launched in 2021. The size of this telescope is around 6.5 meters, and it will be launched in a launch vehicle called the Ariane Launch Vehicle by uh, European Space Agency. And you know already about the Hubble Telescope, which is uh, has a 2.4 meter size. One second, yeah, and Compared to the Hubble, JWST, which is a James Webb telescope, will have 2.5 times the resolution and six times the light gathering capacity. So for such a large telescope to be launched into space, there has to be enormous technological innovations just for the launch. So the telescope will be folded into this launch vehicle. And after reaching the space, the folded primary mirror will unfold into its original shape. So this is an exciting uh, coming up uh, telescope. So one of the other exciting facilities that will be coming up is the Vera Rubin Observatory that will start functioning around 2021. And it is named after this amazing scientist called Vera Rubin. And she's the pioneer of in the discovery of dark matter. And this is one of my favorite pictures of her where She's looking at the images of galaxies recorded in photographic plates with a microscope. Now we have uh, come so far from that time and we can record images digitally using sensors. And Vera Rubin Observatory, which has an 8.4 meter telescope, will also have sensors that are amazing. Uh, so the camera they use will have around 3000 megapixels, which is around three gigapixels. So this is almost like if you have a selfie camera that is like five megapixels, it's almost like keeping 600 of them nearby each other. And this telescope will scan the sky repeatedly at great depth using six filters and look at billions of objects. You can see how the camera changes the filters and filters are essentially uh, changing the wavelength where you look at the sky. So, this decade is also the decade where some of these extremely large telescopes will come into action. There are three mega projects currently under development. The 30 meter telescope, which is. Uh, uh, I don't know, your video is crackling, audio is crackling a little bit. Okay. And now it's better, I think. It's better now? Yeah. Okay. So, this decade is also the decade where some of these extremely large telescopes will come into action. And there are three of these mega projects currently under development. The 30 meter telescope uh, with the size of 30 meters as from the name and the giant Magellan telescope with the 24 meter size aperture and the European extremely large telescope with 40 meter size. So these telescopes will gain three times as much in resolution and 10 times as much in light gathering compared to the current biggest optical telescopes. So why do we need these big telescopes? Just to show an example, this is how much improvement you will obtain from a 30 meter telescope. So this is, these pictures are the pictures of center of Andromeda galaxy taken from the Hubble telescopes. If the same uh, part is uh, observed through a 30 meter class telescopes, you will be able to see much more stars, thousands and thousands of more stars. And there are so many interesting science to be done with this kind of data. So there is a lot to look forward to in the next decade. These projects are also exciting because India will be contributing to some of these mega projects. India is an active partner in TMT where it will be contributing in many uh, aspects. One of it is uh, you, uh, the 30 meter telescope has, is built up of these smaller segments, right? Hexagonal segments. And India will be contributing to the polishing and the support assemblies and a lot of other instrumentation. And there is a large uh, square kilometer array project coming, uh, which is an exciting new radio telescope. And India will be also contributing to that project also. Another very interesting thing that's going to happen is uh, India is planning to set up a gravitational wave observatory. And this uh, program is on track and it's going to come up in the next decade. So apart from this, we are also building our own astronomical facilities. And this is the 3.6 meter telescope that was currently 
installed in Nainital. So this was uh, recently done. And there are a lot of instruments currently being built for this telescope. We have also launched in 2015 uh, a dedicated astronomy uh, satellite called AstroSat. And it has a lot of uh, instruments on it. And ISRO is planning on future mission, <clears throat> future missions uh, following up this. So the future is bright and there are opportunities for everyone. Astronomical instrumentation is one of the most uh, multidisciplinary field and requires a skill set in a lot of different areas, including optics, electronics, mechanical, software, and all together with astronomy. So everybody from every background is required and you have great opportunities coming up. So if you have questions, there is a link in the description box and you could type in your questions uh, in the nighttime astronomy section and we'll be happy to answer it. So I'll just pass on um, now. Good morning, everyone. I'm sure you had a great session so far and you had a lot of information and it shows because you, we also have a lot of questions to take now. So we'll quickly take a few questions from the night astronomy session. And before we move on to the next session, which will be on career. So, so to start off with, our first question is from Abhilash and this is for Samyadai. The question is, which force is responsible for exploding stars? Samyadai, can you? Yeah, sure. Uh, thanks for forwarding the question, Priti. Am I audible? Yes. Okay, uh, that's a good question, uh, Abhilash. So, uh, in most cases, uh, well, the life of a star is basically a tussle between two forces. It's uh, the gravity, which is you know sort of trying to uh, cause, uh, which is trying to you know sort of collapse the star uh, uh, towards its center, and then there is this energy which is emitted by uh, nuclear fusion from hydrogen burning uh, and the energy which is generated from this burning sort of balances this uh, gravity and keeps the star stable. Now what happens when uh, the star sort of loses this energy uh, or this engine is turned off? Uh, so when in the core, inside the core, the hydrogen gets uh, depleted and it has formed helium. Uh, the core sort of started uh, starts collapsing uh, uh, again, and the entire star sort of, you know, uh, co starts collapsing towards the center because the gravity is not balanced. Now, uh, just to balance this uh, entire pressure of uh, this outer envelope of the star. The star inside its core, it tries to fuse in materials because the temperature uh, inside the core starts increasing, the pressure starts increasing, and it tries to burn uh, helium and you know it, it progresses and it tries to fuse higher elements uh, to you know sort of keep supporting this uh, gravitational collapse. Now for stars which are massive than eight to 10 solar uh, which are like eight to 10 solar mass, what happens is uh, apart from producing helium, it produces to higher stages of nuclear fusion where higher elements are produced like carbon, oxygen, and then silicon. And finally, when uh, the inside material or the core material is iron. Now uh, iron is an element which has high binding energy and you'll need a lot of uh, energy uh, or a lot of density, pressure, or temperature to fuse uh, iron. Now, since this uh, core cannot, again, uh, since the energy is turned off again, the star keeps on collapsing and the temperature or the pressure inside is so high that electrons and protons, they fuse together to form a neutron core. And at one point of time, the neutron degeneracy pressure sort of balances uh, this further collapse. It doesn't allow further collapse. And this entire material is sort of rebound 
uh, as an, a violent explosion, which is called the supernova explosion. So this is how generally a star explodes. Uh, explodes and uh, you know more catas uh, more catastrophic collapse can uh, occur for stars which are you know of higher mass say uh, 20 or 25 or uh, 100 solar mass like what happened in the beginning of the universe so uh, generally in this kind of uh, core collapse the material which is left inside is uh, a neutron star whereas for this uh, mass is higher than that like 20 or higher than that solar mass, the uh, core material, what will be left is, uh, will be a black hole. And there can be another way in which supernova uh, or this stars can explode is, stars are generally formed in a binary uh, system. They will have two stars, you know, going around their uh, center of mass and they can be of different mass. And the higher mass stars say about a few solar mass, like two to three solar mass, it could have evolved faster because stars with more mass, they evolve faster than stars with lower mass. And it would have formed a white dwarf. And this white dwarf star can be stealing material from uh, its binary companion, which would probably be low mass, uh, low mass star, which has evolved to a red giant phase. And it will be, you know, sort of stealing material from uh, its companion star and uh, uh, developing this outer layer outside uh, this uh, white dwarf core. And at one point of time, if the pressure uh, of this material is so high that the core again starts uh, collapsing, and then again, uh, there will be uh, you know, fusion of uh, electrons and protons to you know, sort of form neutrons, and the star will again detonate in the form of uh, supernova. So the first category, which I uh, said is uh, supernova uh, type is generally categorized as type two, and this is type one. And then there are several uh, subclasses, uh, which, uh, uh, you know, uh, I can keep on telling about, but uh, probably this answers your uh, question. Thank you. Thank you, Sam. Our next question is from Arka. This is for Shubham. For fusion process, there needs a huge amount of heat energy to maintain a high temperature. So from where this comes from in the beginning of any star formation? Is it caused by gravity? If yes, then how? Shubham, can you? Yeah, it's an excellent question because uh, the life cycle starts with what we call as the protostellar phase. And in, when the star is a protostar, it hasn't yet started burning uh, hydrogen in the core. So you are right, it is because of gravity and the reason is because of the, uh, the pressure at the core of the star created due to the uh, due to gravity. So think uh, the reason is similar to uh, the, why the pressure increases as you go deeper into the ocean because more and more weight has to be supported by that layer depending on the depth. So at the core of the star, which is supporting the entire mass of the star, you have extremely high pressure which causes high temperatures and eventually the protostar contracts enough that the core temperatures are hot enough to ignite the fusion of hydrogen. And that is when it becomes a, a main sequence star. Thanks. Thank you, Shubham. Our next question is from Apurve. This is for Sandeep. In multi-messenger astronomy slide, while merging of two black holes, how is energy released and in what form? Sandeep? Yeah, uh, this is a very good question. Uh, so in the, when the two, uh, so there are two things like in, uh, when two, there are like uh, two black holes can combine or two neutron, stand, uh, neutron star can combine, uh, merge basically act. And black hole or neutron star can merge. When there is a black hole, black hole merger, then you will only observe the black hole, this uh, gravitational waves. So the energy of gravitational waves comes through the space-time ripples. So uh, Einstein uh, theory has told that uh, uh, this general theory of relativity has said that every mass has a curvature around it. So when when two black hole merges, so the so the space-time around that also ripple around each other, and then finally it leads to a energy which which is in the space-time form. So that is observed in the gravitation uh, waves, but the uh, electromagnetic spectrum is only obtained for the neutron star cases when there are neutron star merger. 
so that is observed in the which is kind of a electromagnetic spectrum so i hope this answered your question thank you sandeep uh, our next question is for arun i'll be combining two questions which are very similar in nature and the question is from pranoy and uh, kartikeya so the question is what is dark energy and dark matter and what is the difference between them arun uh thank you preeti um thank you for the questions um, uh i think i'll try to uh, uh explain it as briefly as possible uh so essentially um, uh uh your entire energy of the universe uh, we know that it should be enough to make the universe flat but from uh, big bang nucleosynthesis we know that the ordinary matter makes up only about 5% of it the remaining 95% is your dark matter and dark energy now we know about the existence of dark matter from the uh, rotation curves of galaxies that is from your simpler uh, simple uh, newtonian physics kepler's law uh, as uh, you go farther away from the central mass the orbital velocity should drop but that is not what is observed in the case of uh, uh, the rotation of uh, galaxies the outer galaxies do not seem to slow down their orbital velocity do not seem to slow down so there is some missing mass uh, which we cannot see and that is what is labeled as dark matter uh, on the other hand dark energy is uh, something which is responsible for making the acceleration of the universe uh, so expansion of the universe accelerate uh so in effect dark matter and dark energy sort of works uh in opposite manner uh, dark matter like your ordinary matter has a, a positive pressure uh, attracts uh, gravitationally it attracts whereas your dark energy has a repulsive sort of an effect uh, it it has a negative uh, uh, pressure uh thank you thank you arun so we'll take one last question before we move on to the next session this question is from prone this is for prashant it says that time stops near black hole in event horizon region what is the meaning of time stops it, does it mean every smaller particle spins and reaction all things are stopped prashant yeah hi uh, that's a very interesting question and it's a nice uh, thought process because uh, what you're thinking of is something called uh, gravitational time dilation so what happens is uh, if you have a clock with you and you're moving towards the black hole event horizon uh, the time in your clock will tick very slow compared to the time in a clock uh, by an observer outside who's looking at you from a distance so uh, this happens roughly because uh, as you move closer to the black hole your the escape velocity from the black hole uh, continues to increase so uh for example uh, the escape velocity from the earth surface is 11 km per second but as you move closer to the black hole this escape velocity continues to increase very high and can approach the speed of light so uh since uh, escape velocity increases the time in your frame decreases yeah thank you thank you prashant uh, do you have more to add uh no Thank you. Thank you. So uh, we'll move on to the next session now on uh, career in astronomy. Thank you. Is my screen visible? Yes. Okay. I hope I'm audible as well. Yep. Okay. Uh so uh welcome everyone again uh to this uh this part of the session where we'll be uh giving you a brief overview about careers in astronomy and allied fields and uh, just to remind you again uh uh keep your questions coming and uh, uh you know spend some time in uh, providing a feedback as well because that's uh, important that is what uh, keeps us going so uh hi everyone i'm uh, shamoda i'm a postdoctoral research uh, fellow at uh, macquarie university in sydney australia uh so talking about career in astronomy and allied fields so uh 
as Mohan told you in the beginning that you know uh, we can broadly categorize uh, this area into three parts. The first part is where uh, is theory or simulations where you develop mathematical models to understand uh, the astrophysical, different astrophysical phenomena or different astrophysical objects. The second part is observations and data analysis where you'll be observing using uh, telescopes, using different facilities at different wavelengths, sometimes uh, many several wavelengths. And the data collected, you will be analyzing it using codes or different software to uh, you know achieve your science goals. Uh, and the uh, next part is instrumentation, where you will be you know building up the facilities to observe, like building up telescopes uh, and related instruments like a spectrograph or polarimeter, and you'll be testing or calibrating them. Uh, so all of us who are in this. Uh, uh, group are from these three uh, different parts uh, or th from these three different categories. So I am, uh, I generally am an uh, observer, observer. So I, I, I'm, I fall in the second category. Now, uh, how do you uh, keep your uh, interest in astronomy going or how do you keep yourself motivated? So what you can do is you can visit local planetariums and there are around 47 permanent planetariums in our country and you can attend their public astronomy and space wing programs uh, and you can also join uh, astronomy clubs and interact with amateur astronomers amateur astronomers they play a very important role in uh, modern day astronomy okay uh, so there are uh, we have listed out a few of uh, the astronomy clubs which are in the cities like bangalore or pune and if there isn't any astronomy uh, club in your city, uh, you know, you can take an initiative and you can form astronomy clubs within your college or university or within your city. Okay. And you can uh, take part in national or international uh, astronomy Olympiads. So these are the things that you can do to, you know, keep your interest in uh, astronomy. And how do you get a flavor of how research is in this area? So what uh, we all would suggest or recommend is you can attend summer or winter schools which are conducted by uh, the astronomy or astrophysics research institutes in the country like Indian Institute of Astrophysics in Bangalore, Ayuka in Pune and then there are more. Okay, uh, so you can spend three or six months of uh, during your bachelor's or master's uh, uh, time in this institutes and even Indian Academy of Science actually they have a lot of uh, professional astronomers as members and it's a, uh, it's a two month uh, fellowship program during summer. So you can apply for that as well. And if, if your university allows, you can actually carry out your bachelor's final semester or master final semester project in any one of these astronomy institutes. And there you get to you know, sort of learn the skills uh, which the astronomers use. You can interact with PhD student as well as the faculty and learn more about this area. Now, uh, in general, uh, so uh, how do you become a professional astronomer? So for India, if you have uh, done a bachelor's in, uh, sorry, bachelor's in physics. Uh, so for, sorry, uh, bachelor's in physics, uh, you, after you have done your uh, master's, you can uh, sit for JEST, GATE, or NET examinations, and through the scores, you can apply for PhD in astronomy and astrophysics. Uh, if you have done your BE or BTEC, you can uh, appear for GATE, and through your uh, GATE score, you can do an MTEC in astronomical instrumentation and opt uh, optics. For example, Indian Institute of Astrophysics, they have an integrated MTEC PhD course in astronomical instrumentation. And then you can you know, sort of proceed to do a PhD. And even if you have a, a bachelor's of engineering degree or BTEC degree, you can, uh, with your GATE and JEST score, you can you know, uh, do a PhD in astronomy and astrophysics. And uh, remember that uh, this course will help you get uh, shortlisted, but then uh, most of these research institutes or universities, universities, they will also conduct personal interviews 
So you have to prepare for your uh, interviews as well. And uh, we get a lot. Uh, uh, we get asked a lot of times that how do you prepare? So the thing is, prepare your fundamental of physics and mathematics courses well that you study in your first year or second year. You know, prepare those well. You don't need to uh, study subjects related to astrophysics, uh, but prepare your fundamental courses well. And uh, some of the institutes can have their own entrance test. Well, uh, regarding doing a PhD uh, abroad, so uh, for Europe and Australia, after bachelor's, you need to uh, uh, clear this English proficiency uh, test. Uh, IELTS and even some of the Euro European universities they recognize IELTS and you can proceed to you know do a master's of science with a, a major in physics or astronomy and then you know sort of proceed to do a PhD in astronomy or astrophysics whereas for US uh, you have to appear for GRE and for English proficiency uh, they recognize TOEFL uh, which can you know sort of help you get through a master's or PhD program. Now these are uh, some of the PhD uh, uh, program. Uh, these are some of the institutes which have a PhD program in astronomy and astrophysics. This uh, physical uh, this uh, physical research laboratory in Ahmedabad and TFR Bombay, Ayuka Pune, uh, and NCRA also. And then they, we have uh, these three institutes, uh, research institutes in southern part of the country in Bangalore, IIC, IIA, and Rama Research Institute. And uh, in the north, we have Aries, uh, Nainital, which is for observational studies. Uh, there are also uh, a lot of ISARs and some IITs, which have experts who work on astronomy and astrophysics. And this includes solar, uh, solar astrophysicists. Uh, as well. And then there are some universities, uh, for example, BHU or Delhi University or Osman, Osmania University who have uh, uh, theoretical astrophysicists or even, you know, astronomers working over there. So uh, just take your time and go through the websites of this uh, institutes. Okay. Uh, now, what is the general uh, pathway of the career ladder as an astronomy researcher? So the first step is a PhD, where you learn how to uh, tackle a problem, how you learn how to approach a problem. So you'll be doing a lot of liter uh, literature reviews. You'll be learning about research methodology. You will be uh, picking up uh, uh, software uh, skills. OK, and the next start, uh, next step is the post uh, doctorate, uh, being a postdoctoral uh, research scholar. Uh, so this is when you have, you know, sort of start uh, uh, expanding your area, okay? Sp start spreading your wings, actually. So uh, you start sharpening your research skills, and then you develop new collaborations or start learning new techniques. And you would also be mentoring PhD or master students in your research group uh, at the same time, writing proposals and funding applications. And then you can uh, be a junior faculty at a research institute or uh, university. Okay, so that's where you start building up your own research group. Uh, and you will start mentoring PhD students and you will be basically making preparations for setting up a research group and uh, pushing towards a stable uh, career. And finally, you end up as a faculty or as a senior faculty uh, where you will be, uh, you can be heading the entire department rather than, rather than your research group. And you will need to have a broader perspective of uh, the research uh, fields or the uh, entire scenario. And you will have more freedom in academic interests and you'll be, uh, uh, you'll enable and support research and career developments of younger uh, colleagues. And you'll also be taking up a lot of administrative roles uh, during this phase. Now, apart from, uh, and some of the, uh, you know, uh, uh, area which I mentioned previously, uh, in some of the universities or institutes, even you need to teach over there. So uh, pedagog pedagogical roles are also important. Okay. Now, uh, what are the different other allied fields that uh, uh, are related to this area. Okay, so if you have excellent oratory skills or 
uh, writing skills okay so you can uh, play a role in science communication okay you can share the exciting results and uh, different discoveries with uh, you know students with uh, uh, public and uh, we can also play a role in uh, you know advertising the government on the scientific perspective now uh, uh, because of the skills or the coding skills that you have learned during your phd and postdoc period you can also end up uh, in a career as a data scientist because you know uh, all the future uh, astronomical ventures as uh, all my colleagues were mentioning uh, one has to deal with a lot of large data sets uh, you can also play a role by being an observatory support staff okay uh, now uh, that role is very important because you will be uh, maintaining the telescopes you'll be scheduling and coordinating observations and you'll be maintaining the entire observatory so you can uh, choose a career as uh, an observatory support staff and uh, you can be also uh, end up in uh, the industry uh, if you especially have an engineering uh, background okay uh, industries which produce this uh, uh, instruments required for a telescopes or build up uh, builds up telescope now uh, we have listed a lot of websites here uh, which you can take note of and you can go through uh, regarding jobs or internships uh, so for opportunities in india uh, we have listed a few of the websites which includes isro and uh, iia and aries and for opportunities abroad uh, i mean industries or research institutes uh, and uh, or uh, agencies that build up uh, instruments for uh, you know space uh, so uh, here are, we have listed all the website so uh, take note of that and uh, go through them and uh, again like keep your questions uh, coming okay so uh, that's all from my end thank you Rahul, could you take over? Hello. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. For the next talk, now it's time for question and answer. So first, I'll take daytime questions, and the first question is from Ami, and he's asking exactly what happens when black holes get evaporated. So, and for this, uh, Swagat will answer this question. Swagat. Hello. Hello. Hi. Uh, so this is an amazing question. Uh, what happens when black holes get evaporated? Uh, this this evaporation that they are talking about is uh, is about uh, a quantum mechanical evaporation. If if we leave a black hole uh, in Einstein's theory of gravity and put nothing around it, no material, then this the black hole is going to be perfectly stable and nice system. But because of quantum mechanics, it's going to lose mass through radiation. Uh, this radiation could be in terms of photons or could be in terms of other particles. The point is the rate at which this radiation happens uh, is inversely proportional to the mass of the black hole uh, and the temperature. So because of this radiation, the black hole will look like on the horizon of the black hole, it will look like there is some kind of a glow, black body glow. And the temperature is also inversely proportional to the mass of the black hole. Uh, in fact, a solar mass black hole would have a temperature of uh, very, very small. It's about 10 to the power minus 8 Kelvin. But as it loses for many billion billions of years, it's going to become smaller. And the smaller it is, the faster is the radiation. And in fact, as it approaches a Planck uh, mass black hole, which is 10 to the power minus 7 gram black hole, it's going to explode like a gamma ray uh, burst. It, it will be much uh, energetic than the regular gamma ray burst. But you will see that from a tiny point in space, there is heavy energetic particles uh, like a big uh, burst. and quantum gravity effects will take over or the black hole is going to completely radiate out into photons. So this is not known, but uh, this is roughly the answer. Okay, thanks for the nice answer. Now we go for the second one. And then this question is from Devika K. And 
is there any necessity for the dark matter to exit around it and for this sandeep will answer this question okay so this question i think pertain to this uh, slide i will just share uh, so the question is uh, uh, around the milky way disk why we need to have a dark matter so so actually uh, when you uh, there are two things one is the observed rotation curve and uh, th then there is a mass which is required to have that kind of rotation curve so milky way is kind of rotating and this so basically stars in the galaxies are rotating and when you measure the rotation curve then you get something like uh, this and if you if you take account of only this uh, the visible mass which is within the disk basically stellar mass or the bulge mass then you get this uh, rotation curve so as you see that uh, these are are not matching they are not in agreement and to make them agree you need a modeling of dark matter which is uh, surrounding it which is in the spherical shape and have a special uh, profile which we call nfw profile and when you put that dark matter halo then you get this kind of uh, um, you match with this and that's why it is very very important and it was uh, first discovered by vera rubin and as mentioned in the instrumentation talk also of this answers okay thank you for this answer now we'll go for the next one and this question is from gotham and he's asking can you please give me a small note on the engineering techniques that are used in observational astronomy and for this nimbar will answer this question uh hi yeah so that's a nice question uh i mean to answer that question uh normally your volume is a little low ah uh, okay is this better now yeah you can talk a little louder i guess <laughs> <laughs> okay uh yeah so uh, to answer that question uh, the easiest way to um, uh, understand what engineering techniques are used in uh, astronomy is to look at uh, arun slides on uh, the instrumentation used in astronomy so for example when you are build, building a telescope you need the mechanical design so mechanical engineers can be involved uh, you'll need the design of the optics so optical engineers can be involved you need the uh, design of the uh, camera so uh, electronics engineers can be involved uh, for building the camera Uh, you need the uh, readout of the data so software engineers can be uh, involved in processing the data so a number of engineers uh, can come into place while working uh, on astronomical instrumentation so it's a, it's a really good field uh, and there are a lot of opportunities uh, for engineers to uh, come and play a role in, in astronomy uh, hope that answers the question okay thank you nirmal now we will go for daytime questions and this question is from abila star can we live without magnetism and sajal will answer this question uh, hi abila uh, it's a good question actually so when as sun as earth has a magnetic magnetic field so as this mohan was explaining lot of charged particles are uh, always emerge from the sun and in the interplanetary medium and which is coming towards the earth so if this magnetic field does not exist what will happen those all charged particle or high energetic particles will bombard to that earth atmosphere or it will finally what will happen so nowadays we are every, we are using satellites power grids we are using astronaut to the space so everything will be collapsed so without magnetic field these are not possible the second thing when there is no magnetic field or magnetism on that earth what will happen the uh earth atmosphere it is like a quick cause to erosion this is called like a atmospheric uh, escape or atmospheric erosion so what will happen this uh, slowly this what are the atmosphere what are the gases on that earth atmosphere it will escape so but that is a very slow process so as a concluding note what i can say that how we live as a human that life so that is not possible on that earth if there is no magnetism i hope i answer your question thanks sajal for this nice answer now we'll go for one more daytime question from devika uh you told uh, you had told that astronomers are not safe but we 
in earth are safe so is there any preventive measures for them to survive as the radiations and auroras emitted are highly dangerous so this question is basically about the safety of astronomers and for this mohan will answer uh, uh thank you devika for that question so astronomers and uh, other people who are on earth they are safe so if your question was astronauts then um, they are not protected as much as we are on earth by the earth's magnetic field so they protect themselves i mean if there is a very strong uh, solar storm coming they will be asked to get into the international space station and take shelter there so that is where the predictions come like you have to predict a solar storm before it's coming a strong solar wind before it's coming in a coronal mass ejection so astronomers and other people on earth they are safe and uh, auroras are not dangerous auroras are just uh, excitation of uh, nitrogen oxygen and other atoms in the atmosphere uh, by the charged particles which is coming from the sun and uh, hitting the uh, earth's atmosphere so it is just green and blue light i mean it is not dangerous uh, near the poles these charged particles will affect the power grid so during a strong solar storm you will have power outage so people on earth are safe astronauts can also be safe if we want them i hope i answered your question okay mohan thank you for this nice answer now we will take one more daytime question from ramesh what are the frequencies in which aditya l1 will observe the sun and varun will, will answer this question yeah so hi ramesh uh, as you know that there are seven instruments on the aditya l1 and all of them are observing in different wavelengths so uh one of them is velc called visible emission line of spectrograph uh rather sorry coronagraph uh, which is the heaviest payload it weighs around 170 kg and it observes sun in visible and infrared channels actually then you have a solar ultraviolet imaging telescope suit uh, which weighs around 35 kg and observes sun in ultraviolet region with the help of some 11 filters then uh, we have two x ray images those are rather x ray spectrometers those are called as solex and helios uh, they monitor sun uh, rather solar flares in x ray uh, uh, regions then uh, we have this uh, aditya solar wind particle experiment called aspects and uh, this uh, studies about solar wind properties then the another one is papa called plasma analyzer package for aditya and it's uh, it try to study the solar wind and its energy distribution and the last one is called magnetometer and uh, it's measure the magnitude and nature of the interplanetary magnetic field so yeah so these are the few uh, ranges where the uh, this aditya mission uh, is will observe rather i hope i have answered your question thank you thanks varun for this answer now we will move to the k section questions and the first question is from apur goyal are there any options to keep the passion for astronomy in place while in job so as to get into isro or some other organization later on and this uh, will go for prasant so prasant will answer this question yeah hi uh, very interesting uh, question because uh, i myself am an astronomer now but i came from an engineering background uh, so it is possible to have a job and then uh, uh, move into such a field but uh, to keep the passion alive you need to continue to uh, do say weekend meetings or uh, uh, have your own telescope or uh, look uh, Uh, attend astronomy clubs over the weekends to keep the passion alive uh, as nirmal explained very well in the first answer uh, uh, any any branch almost all branches of engineering have some connect with uh, astronomy in general so uh, software engineers or electronics engineers or mechanical or electron uh, instrumentation so uh, but to get into places like isro or others you need those professional qualifications and expertise in specific areas that they are looking for so you could either do that or you could continue to pursue a phd or masters in such a field 
there are also bridge courses uh, which tell you how to do research so, such as the reap program in bangalore which sam was talking about thank you uh, now we'll move for another question and this question is from abila stars uh, and he has two similar questions how can i join isro for astronomy research and master degree and this will sajal will answer this question hi abilas uh, you can join isro after master degree so there are several way to join isro as a career suppose you have btech or master degree then you can join as an engineer to isro so you have to see that so every 6 month or every one year they call for the position so you can apply for that position you can write the exam and qualify the interview and get into that engineering post in isro but to do research in astronomy and astrophysics uh, in is, uh, isro uh, there are several way so sometimes they call for a grf like a junior research fellow or senior research fellow which also you can um, do join after master degree like masters in physics or applied mathematics or some other subject so you have to see the criteria what they are asking for so for that you have to qualify gate exam or net exam or gest exam or isro sometime organize their exam you can qualify that and appear for the interview you can join so there is another also there is a another way is called jap joint astronomy program which is conducted by uh, isro indian institute of astrophysics uh, uh, rri iisc so if you also qualify that exam after first year of your phd coursework then you can choose which institute you want to continue your research so there is a, another possibility to you can join isro also so so you can do as a engineer or you can join as a junior research fellow or after junior research fellow also some other organization you can directly join as a senior research fellow as a senior research fellow at irso so so there are several ways so you have to see that which subject like you, what is your interest matches uh, when they publish that uh, advertisement so you have to look for that and then you can apply it is better always after your master degree you qualify on national level exam like net gest get so with that score you can always go directly for interview i hope i answered your question thanks sajal now we'll take another question from adesh thawale and he is asking what scope does a chemist have in the field of general astronomy please elaborate on the work done by astrochemists in general so arun will answer this question yeah uh, thank you for the question um, uh, actually astrochemistry and astrobiology are uh, emerging areas in uh, uh emerging fields actually uh, within astronomy itself but uh, uh, as of now unfortunately there are no courses uh, in astrochemistry or astrobiology uh, in india but there are universities uh, in uh, europe us and australia which do offer uh, undergraduate courses and uh, even up to phd's in these areas uh, in fact um, uh, under prl there is uh, an astrochemistry society of india which was established in 2015 which uh, does organize certain outreach programs related to different areas in astrochemistry so probably as a first level you can uh, look at uh, some of these outreach programs and uh, even the newsletters that are being published by them thank you now we'll take our last question uh, this is similar to our previous question but uh, this is a little bit specific so this question is from riya verma and She is asking. I want to pursue astronomy as a career. I am preparing for ITJM and JEST exams. Which branch should I opt in MSc Physics or Astronomy based on career opportunities? Sandeep will answer this question. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, this is a, a very good question in the sense of career when you are, when you need to choose between branches. So yeah, if you are uh, preparing for JAM or JEST. then uh, you will be basing uh, basically getting admission into uh, uh, physics branch which which will be uh, which will kind of provide you base in astronomy so apart from this branch you need to be very strong in the basics because if you are going to take into admission into astronomy so it's not necessary that you need all the astronomy information beforehand 
so if you have very strong base in astron uh, physics then it will be good so i i think uh, uh, to be specifically you can take physics but sometime in mathematics also if you do msc then people can come into this astronomy but physics is the main if you want to crack the interview so in that sense physics will be good okay thanks thanks for this answer now we'll take one question from day and night time okay so the question is from ashish modak and he's asking what is stable and unstable lagrangian point varun will answer this question yeah so the stable and unstable uh, lagrangian points are the places where uh, the satellites uh, um, spend less fuel basically so if you are at an unstable point with a very minimal disturbance your satellite may move out of that uh, uh, i mean stable point so you have to come with uh, certain energy rather over there whereas the uh, stable points are areas where even if a small disturbances are given to the satellite that does not move from that point so these are uh, the two classifications of the lagrangian points and these meta stable are uh, rather these unstable points fall in a line and in a single line between earth sun system whereas the un, uh, the stable points rather are the uh, 60 degrees away from this these two lines i hope i have answered your question thanks for for this and for this answer and uh, now we'll move uh, to the night time question from pranoy sarkar and uh, he is asking is that clear to us that only one big bang happened before the born of everything or multiple big bang happens swagat will answer this question um, <clears throat> in in uh, classical theory of einstein's uh, gravity uh, if we trust it all the way to very very high energies then it would be one big bang where space and time everything began uh, however all the modern ideas uh, do not point to this for example uh, einstein's theory is going to change and something is going to happen when um, when the temperature of the universe was around 10 to the power 20 to 10 to the power 30 degree kelvin uh, i i'll i'll quote two two of the ideas the first idea would be that uh, our universe um, came out as a bubble from uh, a pure vacuum state uh, this this is too sounds too fancy but uh, uh, this has been this is called quantum creation of the universe and this is a very uh, hot topic in physics uh, it, it turns out if if we leave a pure vacuum uh, without any particles it's not stable and it's possible that a bubble of particles will come out of it and if something helps it to get expanded once it will become a big classical universe the second idea uh, is is the idea of multiverse where a big bang is not an uh, is not a unique event um, big bang is just uh, choosing one one set of parameters for your, for your theory for example choosing one kind of electron mass proton mass uh, fine structure constant so it gives rise to this kind of universe where you have atoms and molecules and life and there would be many such bangs happening at different places in the world where the parameters of uh, different particle masses and interaction strength would be so different that life may not even exist there so this is another picture the last picture is uh, called emergent universe where universe was in a different state probably it was static or probably it was expanding in accelerated way but it didn't look like our universe but then it made a slow transition to the kind of universe that we see filled with particles and expanding initially slowly and then now accelerating so this question is far from uh, settled uh, i think it might even take hundred hundreds of years to finally get the answer the point is we have ideas and we do not know what is the answer okay sir okay so thank you for this answer now we'll take the last one uh, last question for this session and that question is from devika how do we detect the atmospheric compositions and details of an exoplanet avinas will answer this also uh hi uh, so that's a very good question uh, i'll share the screen to show how it is done quickly yeah so as you can see here in the spec if you search for transmission spectroscopy of exoplanets online 
you will get the answer to this question, which is that uh, we cannot see exoplanets directly when we look through the telescopes. What we see are the effects of the exoplanets when they pass in front of the stars. So what happens is when the starlight passes through the planet's atmosphere, we can get a certain kind of spectrum. And we can differentiate that spectrum from the stars, the, the, the combined spectrum of the star and planet, which will help us understand what kind of elements are there in the planet's atmosphere. So there are techniques, uh, very, uh, uh, very high precision, high resolution spectroscopy techniques, uh, which are done to find this. And this is on the front line of astronomy as of now. I hope I answered your question. Thanks, Avinas, for this answer. As we don't have much time, so it's time to conclude. And for this, I'll invite Sajan. Sajan? Yes. Yeah. Can you see my slide? Uh, not yet. No, you have to share the screen. Okay. No? Yes. Yes. Uh, I hope you all have like a good session today and you have learned a lot of about daytime astronomy, nighttime astronomy and instrumentation. Even we have given some brief overview how to pursue career in astronomy and astrophysics. I hope you had all good session today. And if you have any question, any query, any suggestion, please write to us in this askastronomer at gmail.com. And you know, always feedback is better to improve our way of exchanging knowledge. So always write your good or bad feedbacks to us. And always you want to update our website. So please keep visiting this particular website. So then you can get that new news, what we are going to do. Uh, and even some some good updates is there so you can always check into that and if you have need any suggestion that also uh, write to us in this email ID. and i would like to thank all of you to attend our this session and i also want to thank all of the speaker and all of the our colleagues who answered and participate actively for this session thank you very much